find out if you're ready for love. Here's your marvelous host. Hello, and welcome to Ready for Love Radio. This is your host and love coach, Nikki Lee. Today, I have got a guest with me who I actually just told her this. She has not been on the show with me since show number two. So I, but I, I finally convinced her to come back. And last time we talked about communication. And this time we are going to talk about surrogate partner therapy. And I have a feeling most of the people listening, if they've heard of uh, a sex surrogate or surrogate partner therapy, they probably have some misconceptions about what that really is. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the source. We are going to talk to Tova Fader. And Tova is going to be able to straighten out any misconceptions. We are going to, we're going to get the true story about what this really is. And we're going to talk about a book that she wrote. And, and I, get to, I even get to say that I, I helped. <laughs> I, I did get to help. This is one of my favorite projects that I've worked on with a client ever. So I, I did get to help. Got to do some of the editing work with her and thoroughly enjoyed getting to read these the interviews that she did and learn more about it. And it just, it just, it's fascinating beyond words. Y'all are going to thoroughly enjoy all the things you're going to learn in this interview. And I highly recommend the book to anybody anybody that wants to know more about this. So let me tell you a little bit about her, and then we're going to dive right in. Dr. Fader received her undergraduate degree in psychology. She completed her studies in the Institute for the Advanced Study of Human Sexuality, where she received her Ph.D. She is also a credentialed sex educator and clinical sexologist. She has continued postgraduate studies in psychology and human sexuality at UCLA. She, she is a nationally recognized expert in human sexuality, particularly sexual dysfunction. She works primarily with the behavioral sensate focus, which is absolutely fascinating, you all. Just an awesome topic to study. It's an approach that was pioneered by sex researchers Masters and Johnson. And if you've ever watched the, the TV show Masters of Sex, you probably learned a little bit about that. But she can, she can teach you much, much more than TV shows. Her practice has always included couples, singles, men, and women. She's also a certified dating coach, which enables her to work with shy clients to help them develop their social skills. She is a member of the American College of Sexologists, and she is the author of eight books, and I know them all very well. <laughs> Tova, it is awesome to have you with us. Well, thank you, Nikki. It's uh, my uh, pleasure to be here. So I tell you what, the name of the book is Sex is the Least of It. And I, the first time I heard that, it, that, that title perfectly just nails it. It just sums up the name of the book. So why did you name the book Sex is the Least of It? Well, I thought this was the perfect title for the book because surrogate partner therapy, or as it's been known previously, sex surrogacy, it's such a widely misunderstood field. Um, the primary misconception is that surrogates, if people have heard the term surrogate at all, what they associate with it, with it is that there's a group of women Maybe they've had some kind of training. We don't know exactly what that is. But basically, a surrogate partner is a fancier name for uh, escort or prostitute. And uh, so the, the misconception is that surrogates are basically uh, prostitutes with a better name. Uh, and the, uh, the truth of it is, that a very, very minuscule amount of time in, say, a four to six to one year of therapy with a surrogate uh, is under 10%. So most of the time is spent in sex education, communication around intimacy, talking about and understanding the particular sexual or intimacy or social problem the client is having, uh, looking for uh, avenues the client can pursue to experiment a little bit and expand their boundaries in areas that they find um, anxiety-provoking or intimidating, 
help them feel more comfortable within their own bodies, learn about their bodies, um, and, um, and also explore the sensory and sensual aspects of the body. But that is without direct sexual contact. So it's a very small part of it. As a matter of fact, to quote a book, sex is the least of it. <laughs> there you go. You know, there's, there's so many things in, in between, you know, working with you and, and reading these interviews and, and learning so much more about what's done. It, there's, there's so many things that, that pretty much every person could benefit from some aspect of this training. There's so many things that, that just your normal person doesn't learn that they don't know about their own self or their partner, you know, that would benefit them to have a more satisfying personal life, intimate life, and sexual life. They just don't, you don't learn these things as a normal person. It's true. And typically what we know about sex is either what we've heard from our parents and we don't know how misinformed or uneducated they might be about sexuality or uncomfortable talking about sexuality with their own children. Um, and, or we hear it from kids our own age. We hear it in high school or junior high, and we hear the stories floating around. And that's probably the worst education because, as we know, uh, girls and boys, and I, I think primarily boys, but girls as well, they like to inflate their uh, knowledge about sex, their experience with sex, all the various uh, kinky and unusual things they've done, where, whereas in truth they may not have done very much. So here we have parents who are uncomfortable with the topic. We have our peers who are uneducated about the topic, and that forms the foundation of what we typically know about sex. Not a good right. recipe. Right. That's very true. It, it, uh, interesting. <laughs> it's interesting. It's just interesting. It's a wonder. Some days, don't you, you just find it miraculous that, that babies are ever born as little as people know about sex? It's <laughs> true. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, it's not funny. It's actually kind of sad some days. So what prompted you to write the book? Why did you, because this was, this was quite an undertaking. I, I can say that in all honesty, <laughs> it was a major undertaking to write this book. What in the world prompted you to do this? Well, yes, this was a project that seemed to take on a life of its own, and it just continued over a period of years. Um, but as a sex educator and counselor, I have worked with surrogates for appropriate clients, and I saw the tremendous value and the tremendous progress that clients would make. Um, you know, a client has a certain relationship with a therapist. They have a different kind of relationship with the surrogate. With a therapist, there's a little bit of what some in the field of psychology has described as a power imbalance. You have the client who's coming to you with their problems. You have the therapist who is in more of a sort of an up power position. With the surrogate and the client, they come together as equals. They're kind of just folks. They're informal together. And the most important thing is that they create a rapport. And it is the relationship that is so important and from which everything else unfolds. So knowing the value of this particular form of sex therapy and also knowing just how uh, the widespread the misconceptions were, I decided to write a book that would really, really clarify the true facts and also give the, the field... A, a voice and a picture. And so I interviewed 27 uh, surrogate partners from around the world. Uh, three, others were, three other surrogates were included uh, by way of um, interviews that they had given. And I wanted to hear from the surrogates, why did you start uh, doing, you know, going down this path? 
what interested you, what is your experience in working with these clients, and, and what ultimately have you gained in this process as well. And I thought this was a very, very compelling a story and one that needed to be told. It definitely needed to be told. Well, and, and I loved how they were so supportive and they, they understood what you were trying to do. They wanted to help get the story out there, you know, and they they understood that people needed to know the truth. I, mean, I can't imagine that they, they hadn't had to deal with the misconceptions and people coming to them with with all the you know with all the wrong impressions of what they were trying to do, mm-hmm. and what was great is that when I started to contact surrogates about being included in the book, the word sort of started to spread throughout the the surrogate network, and I found out that there were surrogates in Holland, which I didn't know about, that there were surrogates in England, there are surrogates in uh, Israel. And so the the word kind of spread, and then people started coming to me saying, you know, can I be included in your book? So it was really a wonderful synergy. Yes, yeah, this, this whole sex educator community, it, 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 it's very, very small sometimes. <laughs> the word really does spread. <laughs> but it spreads in a good way, which is awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the <laughs> surrogate community is a small community. Um, yeah very small and so the the word can travel quickly definitely it, it really does well and the the internet definitely helps it spread <laughs> so, and it's funny because you especially facebook really helps because you'll you'll go and you'll you know you, you get a, a friend invitation from one and, and it immediately pops up and it says you know you, you've got all these these um connections in common and, and you, you click to look and, and it's like, oh, yeah, and you see all the, you know, all the familiar names. <laughs> no. Absolutely. And on, on my Facebook page several years ago, a name popped up. You know, you, you might consider having this person as a friend. And it was uh, Dr. Ronita Loney, who is a wonderful sex therapist in Israel and has her own sex therapy clinic. She founded, she got her education in the fundamentals of surrogate partner therapy as part of her PhD program. She, she was not a surrogate, but she learned in depth about surrogacy uh, during her studies and also from a, a practicing surrogate um, who lived in a neighboring state that she was able to visit and really find out in de- detail one-on-one what this process was about, and she was found this so compelling and so exciting in terms of being able to help clients in a in a new, a dramatic and new and highly effective way that she opened up her own uh, counseling center in Tel Aviv. And by the same token, uh, there's a uh, the Acasa School in England, which uh, also trains surrogates and, of course, uh, deals with clients. And there were there were several places uh, throughout Southern California as well. Um, there is a certain sort of trajectory of surrogate partner therapy. There was a lot going on in the 60s and the 70s. And around the mid-80s, for whatever the reasons were, uh, there was kind of a drop-off and then a resurgence in the mid-2000s. So the places where surrogates train, uh, the therapists who work with surrogates, has all kind of shifted um, over the last 20 years from from its inception. Interesting. Interesting. Well, and like I said, there's there's such a diversity of the people that you interviewed in, in different ages. You know, there's some men. There, there was a few men, a lot of women. And, and then you know the people in, the, in a couple of different countries. There was the surrogates. Some still are. Some were in the past. Um, you know, some of the therapists. It was interesting seeing the therapist's point of view, since they were the ones referring clients to them. It just it was it was interesting seeing all the different points of view. You know, it's it's not you're not just seeing one point of view of of what's done and how it's done. It just I liked all the different all the different perspectives that came together. Right. And as part of surrogate partner therapy, there really are I'd say three different major components. There is the surrogate partner, but there is also the therapist who refers the client to the surrogate. There is the training agency or clinic 
that trains the surrogate. Um, and right. all three are very, very important. And in the book, the trainers, the surrogate trainers, um, you know, talk about their particular training programs. There are differences, slight differences, in how surrogates are trained. The, in the broad overview, it's pretty much the same, but there can be, it can be nuanced in different ways. Right. Uh, the therapists, uh, the, the wonderful thing is that there are therapists who are increasingly becoming aware of the value of surrogate partner therapy. Um, in the past, because of its misunderstood and therefore controversial nature, there were some therapists who were hesitant to work with surrogate partners because they, they had concerns about ethics and um, about legality. Every therapist that I interviewed and therapist in my own circle uh, here in Los Angeles, those who have worked with surrogate partners and have direct knowledge of how the process works and the value to their client they have no questions about surrogacy. They have no issue about, uh, you know, is sex going on all the time? Uh, is there an ethical question? Uh, is there a legal question? What they will tell you is, my client got better. Right. My female client now understands her body and is not ashamed. My male client can now have an erection a, whereby in the past he couldn't. He knows how to work with his body, to control his body, to eroticize his own body. That's the answer you'll hear. So there right. is a large body of therapists who are still educating them themselves about this subject. And um, I think with increasing um, awareness, uh, such as shows like yours, and some wonderful books that have been written, even even in addition to mine, uh, and the movie uh, The Sessions, uh, which was a, a not altogether accurate, but accurate enough uh, movie about surrogate partner therapy, and it was really quite a wonderful movie. There's a m much greater um, openness and awareness now of surrogate partner therapy. Well, and people being open to read the, and, you know, learn more about it, not just take what they hear at face value, go, oh, okay, that's what it is, you know, but, but dig into the things written by the people who are actually living it and doing it and can give them the true story of what it is, mm -hmm. you know, not, like I said, not just taking something that's out there and say, oh, obviously, you know, you know, the, like the mentality of, oh, if, if it's on the internet, obviously it's true, people. <laughs> not you know check check the validity of 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 the information and and check for the the credibility of the person telling you i'm I'm real big on that to make sure that the person I bring on actually does does have the qualifications to tell you the truth about what they're talking about yes, because we know that oftentimes there are um there are uh, hoaxes and exaggerations and all kinds of wild stories that circulate across the internet, which may not be true, yes. More often than not, in some cases. <laughs> and and I was I was just I've, I've got a copy the file for the book up so I could take a look. I can't believe I haven't bought a copy so I've got to get a copy of it. <gasps> I have. Like, I know, it's terrible. <laughs> of course, it's not like I haven't memorized the book right after however many times we went through it to work on it. Yes, you probably but, know it by heart, right? <laughs> I can't imagine I don't. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I memorized all your books, Toby. Come on. <laughs> I really I love the dedication. What, what she put for the dedication was, may future generations of men and women grow up in a sex-positive society where they are nurtured as unique individuals, their varied expressions of sexuality are accepted and honored, and they are encouraged to love with abandon. I love that. Oh, Thank my gracious. You. I did. I did. I did. You know, it just, so many, so many of us never, never got that growing up. And, and I know far, far, far too well from personal experience what it takes to get yourself to that point later when you had the, pretty much the opposite of that for years and years and years. So being able to get to that point at any point in your life is a gift. You know, I was, I was talking to somebody the other day, and I said, you know, the, the biggest gift you could ever, ever give yourself is to love and accept yourself. 
And, you know, I, I well, I posted something on Facebook the other day about, you know, I, I, I wish I could remember the exact wording, but it was it was something about, you know, shame on you for, for not accepting me and, and letting me be, be, be myself, you know, or for accepting me the way I am. We, we need to let people be themselves, be unique, and love them for who they are. And that's a long journey for many people to get to that point of, uh, of enlightenment. And even further, when you talk about undoing some of the damage um, in terms of sexuality uh, done by these myths and confusion, uh, there's some confusion of sexuality and pornography, uh, folks who are raised on pornography, and I don't have an issue itself with pornography, but if that has been your basic exposure to sexuality, it's extremely misleading. And uh, so it can be very disappointing then when you really uh, try to seek out real intimacy or a sexual experience and then find that it's really very different than what you thought it was. And, and that comes from our roots, from our growing up, from our, our Puritan forefathers and foremothers who um, were not open and communicative about intimacy. And we still bear the scars in terms of poor education going all the way back to our English forefathers. So thank you, English forefathers and foremothers, because uh, it's opened up the whole area of sex therapy. It has. Well, and, and actually just, just talked about talked about that last week on the show. That on, I just did a show about porn, and we talked about that, and it's like, it, and it was really, I forget the name of the person that came up with the quote, but I, and there's been some variations on it. It's like, you know, the, the the cure isn't to get rid of porn, it's to have better porn. You know, do it do it in a way that you don't so completely misrepresent things, but do it in a way that, that you represent it in a better way, you know, that you can actually help people. But the thing is, too, and like you said, if, if people were being educated in a better way to, to know the truth, it wouldn't be such an issue. You know, when people aren't getting any real education and their parents aren't teaching them anything or, or they're, they're hiding information, they don't, you know, they won't have any kind of a talk about sex with their kids or they want to act like any, you know, if you think about sex, it, it's a horrible, dirty, awful kind of thing, then they're, they're, they're going to search the information out somewhere. People are curious. Mm -hmm. It's just, we're, we're human. We want to know things. You know, and the thing is, if, if you want to hide things from people, and you want to act like they're not supposed to know things, they're going to find it somewhere. Come That's on, true, and on. unfortunately, where people go is not always the best, not always the best places to go for accurate, informed information. No. Nope, it is not. So tell us about, there's a quote at the beginning of the book from Erica Jung. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the quote. Our, our Erica, Jung, Erica Jung is an author, and she was best known for her first book, The Fear of Flying. And in that book, she has a, a quote. Uh, this comes from her, which I think is absolutely wonderful. It's one of the most brilliant quotes I've ever heard. She says, quote, If sex and creativity are often seen by dictators as subversive activities, it's because they lead to the knowledge that you own your own body and with it your own voice. And that's the most revolutionary insight of all. I like that. And I think that it is so true. It's, it's very profound that when you have a knowing of yourself, a knowing and acceptance and understanding um, and a gentle, what can I say, a gentle knowing of yourself, not a critical knowing, that you, then you bring that confidence with you. You bring that passion, the convictions you have, the awareness that you have. You carry it inside of you, and it radiates outward, and people can feel that. And, you know, if you get a lot of very confident, articulate people together, uh, they can create a revolution. So that's this uh, quote really uh, resonated with me tremendously. I, re I remember. I remember we were putting it in, and she's like, this is going in the book. This has to be in the book. 
<laughs> Very emphatic. This was going in the book. <laughs> well, the way you control people is through knowledge. Yes. Yeah. Right? Definitely. Lack it. of accurate knowledge, lack of any knowledge, um, uh, limiting and... Um, what's the word I want to use, sort of gerrymandering knowledge about a particular subject, limiting knowledge about a subject. Uh, it's a way to keep people in fear and anxiety, uh, ridden with guilt. And when, when you have those feelings, that also radiates inside of you. Um, and can lead to feelings of uh, lack of confidence, of depression, uh, and it it shows in how you carry yourself. Um, certainly, in terms of a social life, if you've not had a good sex education, how do you then reach out to a partner? Right. For a quality sex life, how do you reach out to a partner for? Good communication, direct, gentle, straight-out communication around intimacy. I mean, a lot of people have trouble just talking about uh, just about any issue as it pertains to relationship. But then when you add the component of it being about sexuality, then it pushes it that much more. And people hide uh, people can, people are very creative and can hide a wealth of lack of information in their behavior. Uh, so it's, it's not unusual to see relationships fail or people having multiple relationships because they, they can't really put all the pieces together. So they do the best they can with what they have, but it's not out of whole cloth. It's not a whole quilt. It's a little patch in the quilt, and that's right. not enough to create a wholesome, viable relationship. And I think that sexuality is one of the core characteristics of our being, um, of our psychological development, of our behavioral development, characterological development. And whether or not we think about it, in other words, whether we're comfortable having it in our minds and acting on it, whether we are fearful and intimidated, uh, that will absolutely express itself in terms of the desire to be social, the desire to uh, be in partnership with someone else, and the comfortability and fun and joyfulness of having a sexual experience with someone. And it should be joyful. Yes, it should. It shouldn't be work. I know. <laughs> well, if it is work, it should be really enjoyable. Yes, <laughs> the best work. I can tell people I love my job. <laughs> okay, now, now, I'm going to bring this back around. So people might be listening going, okay, now we've gotten off topic. We're not talking about surrogates anymore, but we are. Why, how, how do we take what we've been talking about as far as communication and understanding sexuality and how does that all tie together to why people would seek out a surrogate partner? Because those are uh, many of the basic reasons that people seek out sex therapy for everything that we've just been talking about. (laughs) See how I brought that all together? (laughs) (laughs) Very neat. Very neat indeed. Uh, So if a person knows about surrogate partner therapy, uh, their first base is to seek out a sex therapist to evaluate them for appropriateness to work with a sex uh, with a surrogate partner. Not everyone who wants to work with a surrogate partner is necessarily appropriate, right? They may have basically psychological issues, not really so much sexual. They may have issues that really need to be uh, have a light shined on them by the therapist, not really by the surrogate partner. So, but for those who sort of meet some basic criteria in terms of appropriateness, 
and if they're comfortable with the idea, then they are um, hooked up with a surrogate partner. Now, for those who know nothing about surrogacy, they may go to a therapist, and the therapist may introduce the idea. What do you think about this? We might work with a surrogate partner to focus on this issue or that issue. So the first meeting takes place in the therapist's office, and you have the client and the therapist and the surrogate. And it's really an introduction, an introduction just like if you were meeting someone else, anyone else, at a, at a dance, at a lecture. You're introducing yourself saying a little about yourself. And the therapist and the client surrogate are able to ascertain if this is a comfortable uh, relationship and has the potential for a building really good rapport. Um, so that's the first step. And so a person may come to a therapist for you know all the reasons. They can be sexual issues in terms of sexual dysfunction, uh, damage to the genitals. It may be really more of an intimacy issue. Uh, there are uh, some folks who are uh, anxious just being in a room with a person of the opposite sex. How do you talk? How do you talk about yourself? Do you mainly talk? Uh, are you able to listen? Do you only listen but don't disclose anything about yourself? A lot can be learned from our communication styles. So that's an essential part of, of surrogate partner therapy as well. And then this, when this, this, the uh, therapist supervises the whole process. Right. Well, and, and if I remember correctly, too, when, when you're doing it that way, too, the, the surrogate actually is doing reports to the therapist to let them know how it's going. So the therapist is monitoring it, and, and you've actually got all three of them working together to, to see how the therapy is going to make sure that... Uh, right, to monitor the progress. Thank you. Thank you. Or to monitor also if perhaps the surrogate and the client have hit, have hit the wall. If there right. is something impinging on the process, either something that the client has not told the surrogate perhaps something the surrogate has not told the therapist about herself or himself. So this, this is what we call the triadic model. The triadic model is the therapist, the surrogate, and the client. And all are equal in this relationship. The therapist monitors the process and has his or her sessions with the client at a separate time. The surrogate and client meet also at a separate time, at their time. So I want to clarify, there are not three people in a room. There is uh, two people uh, in both uh, different contexts. And the surrogate does write a report on her observations of the client's behavior, of his or her affect, um, whether they are able to initiate uh, certain conversations or certain behaviors, if they have done their homework from the previous week. And yes, there is homework. Even in surrogate partner therapy, there's very important homework. And so the, the therapist is kept in touch, both by the client through his or her sessions with the therapist and by the surrogate by phone and also by written report. So we want to make sure, like any relationship, that this relationship is proceeding smoothly. So in a sense, the client and the surrogate are like a couple. It's like taking them through a couple's therapy process. Uh, and so the therapist is an integral part of that. Very good. I, was, you know, I, I forgot the, the triadic that, that you mentioned, I was I was seeing a three-legged stool in my head, but I couldn't remember what it related to. That's what it was. <laughs> okay. The triadic model. <laughs> it's been a couple of years since we went through all this. <laughs> right, and it's not a model like Heidi Klum is a model. It's a very right. different kind of model. Very true. All right. Do, do men and women both go to surrogates, and is it usually more men that go or more that women that go? Well, in the past, typically it's been more men um, because men are 
characteristically more driven by their sexuality. Women are driven by relationship. So a woman might seek out a therapist to work on her relationship, not realizing that embedded in what she feels is a relationship problem is really a sexuality issue. Right. A man, because he, his prowess is his sexuality, um, is concerned about the workings of his genitals. If something right. isn't working, he is propelled to find out why, to seek an answer. So a man will ask about a surrogate partner. A man may, um, if there are no surrogate, may ask for <clears throat> a sensual massage. Most women won't do that. They're going to go to a therapist or a counselor. Over the last 15 years or so, there's been a really, really interesting development that's occurred, and that is that more and more women are seeking out surrogate partner therapy as women are finding their own voice in so many aspects of life, they are also finding their voice when it comes to sexuality. Uh, in the limelight right now uh, are all kinds of issues regarding sexual harassment, sexual aggression, um, sexual intrusion, sexual inappropriateness. And because these uh, topics have started to uh, become more openly discussed over the last 15, 20 years. We find women now seeking out male surrogates. So this is a actually a, a very hopeful uh, new wave that we're seeing in the SPT surrogate partner therapy, and it's the uh, women recognizing their right to have a, a pleasurable sex life to understand their sexuality, and to seek out partners who will respect that sexuality and be good partners for them. Very good. Glad to see women giving themselves permission to have a satisfying sexual life. Mm -hmm. And to be sexual and to be sensual and to be body and naughty and all those things that are different aspects of sexuality. The sex has various masks, you know, one mask is tenderness, uh, caring, compassion. One mask is simply, it's a form of communication. Uh, one mask is naughty, uh, sexy, uh, risque, and that's a part of sex also. Because if we're really, really in touch with our bodies, we know the pleasure that can be derived for, from our bodies or we learn that there is pleasure that can be derived from our bodies, then we get full range of all kinds of expression when it comes to sexuality, whether it's the positions, whether it's the conversation, whether it's the, the wardrobe, the attire. Uh, sex has many different colorations to it. And women are now saying, I want all of those colors. I want every <laughs> single color that there is. Give me every hue that's available. Give me the rainbow. <laughs> yes, I want, I want my rainbow of sex. <laughs> I like that. The hardest thing is, is giving yourself permission to start diving into all that. Yes, it is. And the giving of the permission is actually a very deep subject. Yes. Because the permission harkens back to how were we raised? What where were the messages that we got from our mother? What were the messages we got from our father or other close members of our family? What are the messages that we've gotten from our religion? Yes. From our society. And we tend to be surrounded by uh, a very sex negative society. Yes, we are, some more than others. Yes, yes. And uh, I will say that, that religion, for people who've been raised in a, in a very strict religious household of any religion, pick it out, that's a good religion. And oftentimes they are taught that sex is dirty, yes. that it's certainly not to be enjoyed if it doesn't have to do with procreation. So if you don't right. want to procreate every time you have sex, it kind of puts a damper on having sex. 
and there are so many ways to feel guilty in the world. It doesn't matter if uh, your religion is, is Muslim, if it's Jewish, if it's Hindu, if it's Catholic, Christian. It doesn't matter. Religion is um, an all-purpose uh, negative message for most people. It's not to say that there aren't beautiful psalms and passages about men and women being together and lying together, but that's as man and wife. Right. So if you're not married, you got a whole bunch of problems then. And even if you are married, it's not for pleasure, it's for procreation. We, you know, I, I was researching, this is a little bit off topic, but, but since I'm talking to you, <laughs> so, we always get off topic about something. But, you know, I was, I was researching something when I was, I was writing some articles for you one day. And it was so, I was researching, and it, it dawned on me that if, if you're taking it at face value, okay, and you're taking it literally, and you're saying that sex is only for procreation, so then technically women aren't supposed to have sex past about 50 then, right? Yes, because you can no longer procreate. And why would you want to if you're over 50? Well, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's the mythology. Okay. Okay, well, you just I take a bridge. <laughs> and I'm like, now, wait a second. Oh, hold on now. <laughs> you know, so. But, yeah, that, that kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, all right, now, we have a real serious problem here. <laughs> you know, so. And uh, the surrogates that I spoke to uh, spoke in terms of having clients anywhere from their 20s to their 80s. Mm -hmm. There may be, uh, say, a man or a woman who's been married for 50 years or 60 years. Their spouse passes away. Here they are in the dating field. They may have problems with libido, uh, sex drive, uh, arousal, erection, but they want to date, so... They seek out the, uh, the help of a sex therapist who may suggest a surrogate partner. So the, the desire and the passion for sexual expression extends throughout our lifetime, and it's not limited to the first 40 years of life. Very true. I, I think it's wonderful that, that people you know, reach out and, and want to learn more about not just the mechanics of sex, but also the the intimacy and and like, like I said, I've learned so much as far as sensei focus and being more in touch with all of the, the senses and and the the sensuality and such a broad topic and it, it just it just adds so much more to the experience because mm-hmm. people if, if you're not taking all of the senses into account, you're missing so much. Sexuality is more than what we call friction sex, <laughs> which means penis and vagina sex, and that's the only legitimate way to have sex. Nothing else really counts. So we know that that's, you know, hogwash. But our society defines sex in that way, and it's, it is because of that definition that it is procreation and for purpose that many of our sexual anxieties actually develop. Uh, so, so that can be, you know, a, a definite problem. One of the things I wanted to throw in is what astounded me when I did all of the interviews was the educational level of most of the surrogates. I interviewed about 25 surrogates, and of that number, there were several PhDs who were surrogate partners. Six had earned PhD degrees. One had a DHS, which is a Doctor of Human Sexuality. There were six with master's degrees and seven bachelor's degrees. So when you take that into account, 22 out of uh, about uh, 27, that's about a 78% figure, 80% of the surrogate interview population that have advanced degrees. And that's a figure that's dramatically higher than the national average. So, th- so these are people, men and women of quality and of substance, of uh, genuine desire to help someone else to reach out. And they have the ability through their own comfort level, through their own experiences and education, to be able to do that. Not everyone can so it takes a, a special breed. I think is it the the Marine Corps that says we're looking for a few good men. Exactly. Uh, 
Well, in the surrogate partner therapy, you know, they're looking for a few good men and women. In, in the layout of the book, we included pictures of most of them. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was even interesting just to see the diversity of, of the pictures of each one of them. There were some real characters. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. We have surrogates, I think, who were practicing in the 60s. Yep. And so they're now, uh, I guess, in their 70s now. And still continuing, this particular couple, both he and exactly, she. That's exactly what I was thinking about. <laughs> they were both surrogates. They had their own independent practices. And they continued to this day to be active in terms of sex education. They give a seminar in their church on sexuality. So it's a passion that stays for many people throughout their lifetime, that they are, you know, they're, they're educators, they're teachers. They, someone once said that the deepest place that they, they touch anyone is in their heart. And I think that's true. I yep. think that's true from what I've uh, experienced and observed. Like I said, it just, it, there, there was so much information. And, even, and, and I mean, any, anybody in the audience that's an author, you know how many times you go through the information when you're, when you're editing a book and you're laying it out and you're making sure everything is word perfect and you want to make sure, and, and boy, did we go through this book. <laughs> you know? Over and over and over. <laughs> You could say that. <laughs> but, I mean, every single time I found something else. You know, every time there was, there was one more little thing that, that was just, it was just something interesting somebody shared. So, I mean, no matter how much you think you know this topic, there was one more little neat thing that was picked out of there. It was really, really interesting. One of the other myths that has been told to me is that when a client is hooked, say a male client is uh, connected with a female surrogate, that um, they have a um, they can choose their surrogate based upon how the surrogate looks, or their surrogate is going to be kind of, uh, looking like a Playboy model, and uh, that is not the truth. <laughs> That's not the truth at all. Uh, most surrogates you wouldn't know them at in the grocery store or in the pharmacy. They're just average folks. They don't necessarily go around and you know even you know sexy uh, garb, sexy attire. They're just plain folks. So uh, when I've heard uh, people ask me, well, can I have a surrogate who's about not over 25, and I, I like blonde, and I would prefer big breasts? Well, that's where the education starts because it's not a, it's not a beauty contest, and you don't put in your quarter and get back the answer to your dreams. What you get is a highly skilled highly educated, and we haven't even talked about the training of surrogates, but highly trained person who will be able to educate them, sensitize them, guide them, clarify things for them, provide information, teach, communicate, and be part of this very special relationship with them. That includes giving honest feedback. So, if a client, if a surrogate feels that a, that a client is being uh, rude, okay, or unpleasant, highly critical, too critical, the surrogate can feed back and say something like, well, is this, is this the way you would talk to a woman on a date? If you were on a date, would you be this negative? Would you be this critical? So it's always put in the framework of this is real life. Hey, and is, right. this is, is this the way you would talk to someone that you were on a first date with or a second or third date? And if the answer is, well, no, I wouldn't, well, then why do you do it here? Right. Or, well, I don't know if I did. I don't think I'm critical. Well, you know, it could be a possibility. Maybe it's something we should uh, take a look at. So the surrogate is a mirror, a giant mirror that provides unique feedback to the client in a gentle and loving and direct manner. Something your best friend wouldn't tell you. Exactly. We actually, believe it or not, only have a few minutes left. So what, what's a few things that you'd like to share with the listeners as far as the actual training that the surrogates go through? And, and there's a lot more information in the book about that. What are just a few of the, the specific things you think they should know? 
Well, right now there are training centers uh, in Los Angeles. There's a major training center in Texas. Uh, There is a training center in Israel and in England. The training consists uh, typically either of 10 straight days, uh, which is called an intensive of training. It may be an experiential four-day course and then homework, which lasts for an additional six months. Then there is an evaluation just in terms of the potential surrogate's knowledge of anatomy, psychology, behavior, communication, all the things that may have STDs, sexual dysfunction, all the things that are, have been covered in the training. Then the client, if they pass that evaluation, they then are, serve an internship which is typically working with three clients over a period of time, a minimum of four months, and that experience is then evaluated by their trainer. And if that seems to work out well, they are uh, credentialed and still highly, well, highly supervised. All surrogates are supervised, but certainly within the first two years, given a more extensive supervision to make sure, again, that they're on the right track. This is a very sensitive process that really goes to a client's depths. And you want to make sure that the surrogate is on board just as well as the client being on board. So the, the training is rigorous. There is a dropout rate because people find perhaps in the middle of the training, hey, this is, this is more than I thought it was going to be. There's much more involved. What's all this academic stuff? What's all this data-driven stuff? And what's all this stuff of me being in therapy and finding out more about myself and my issues, which is not a requirement, but many uh, people who are serious about the process will initiate their own private therapy to make sure that their issues don't be part uh, of the therapy of the client, right? You don't, want, you don't want the surrogate's uh, problems to enter into the therapy with the client. True. I, I, I think that would have to be so important. My gracious. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the surrogate needs to be super sensitive to themselves as well, their behavior, the way they feed things back, how they respond to criticism, and how they respond to uh, when a client lashes out. Um, All of this is very important. So there's a lot of soul-searching and depth uh, education that goes along for the surrogate. So it's not a process that anyone can take, that anyone passes. Um, There's probably, there could, well, there is a dropout rate. I don't want to throw out a figure, but there's a definite dropout rate in terms of those who start the training and those who finish the training. So it's not for everyone, but for those people for whom it is the perfect profession, they are, they become an angel to their to their clients in many ways. No doubt. No. Well, it, it, it's life-changing for the people that, that go through, especially the ones that just cannot have any kind of a intimate relationship with another person. Mm-hmm. You know, because I mean, I, I think anybody that at, that's had any kind of a limiting situation for, for whatever reason with other people, you know, as far as having a relationship, whether sexual or intimate or whatever with other people, and have been able to, to break through that in whatever way and and experience a more intimate, satisfying relationship with, with a partner. Mm-hmm. And, and, it, it, and a good part of a surrogate's work is just helping a client be more social. Perhaps yeah. he or she has been isolated, is fearful of others. They'll right. go on practice dates, or the surrogate will sort of shadow the client as he or she goes out into the dating world, a dance or a lecture or, or something like that. So there's a lot of social skills that's, that's brought into it. So it may not be directly about sex, but it may help a client develop friends develop a social circle, uh, make contact with others who can be important in their life, 
and for whom they can be important in the lives of other people as well. So many ways that, like, and, and like, like we said in the beginning, sex is the least of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. See, now they're seeing why the title of the book works so well. <laughs> and there's a great quote that uh, I want to leave your listeners with. It's from the Talmud, which is a holy book in the Jewish religion. And the quote is, Every blade of grass had its angel that bends over and whispers, Grow, grow. And that's what a surrogate does. Okay. He or she says, I'm going to help you grow. Well, and, you know, we all we all need help growing in some way or another at some point in life. Mm-hmm. So, it does make a difference. Yes, yes, yes. And I hope in the future that uh, the surrogate community can reach out to uh, other communities. Uh, we're now starting to see um, gay and lesbian surrogates, uh, but we're just at the at the the very beginning of that of expansion out into other. Uh, sexually oriented uh, groups within the community, but that's a very exciting innovation. Increasing work with the disabled, of course, uh, right. and just so many areas. Work with wounded warriors who come back and their personal lives are shattered. Their confidence is shattered. Their health is shattered. And surrogates could be of such immense help in this whole field of um, rejuvenating, resuscitating, and bringing back to health our vets who have been so decimated. So there's so many areas in which surrogates can, can help. And I, I, show, I hope, my hope is that we can work through, society can work through uh, its uh, mythology about surrogacy, um, understand the value of it, and therefore let it be practiced on a wider plane in areas where additional thousands and thousands and thousands of people could be helped. I, I knew about, you know, as far as people with, with disabilities and various health issues, and, but I, I hadn't thought about vets, but that, oh my gracious, yeah, that would, that would be huge. Mm-hmm. I feel like calling up the Department of Defense, you know, and saying, I, I yeah. think you should work with surrogate partners, but, but I think there's probably a protocol to dealing with the Department of Defense. <laughs> that would be an interesting, I'd like to be a fly on the wall for that call. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if, if I think of a way to get you in there, I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> so, but you got to let me know. <laughs> so, <laughs> boy, that would be an interesting call to hear. <laughs> well, thank you for shining a light on my book. I really appreciate it. It was a labor of love and a labor of passion. And uh, I hope people buy the book, but I hope they learn from the book. That's the most yeah. important thing. Well, that's that's the whole reason I do the show. So, like I said, I completely understand. And like I said, I, re- I remember working on it. And it, like I said, it, so many of the people that were involved and, you know, did, whether they did quotes or whether they, they looked over it, very things. I mean, that every everybody that, that I remember interacting with that were involved, everybody, it was a labor of love for them. They all wanted to get the message out. So, definitely, because... They they want to clear up misconceptions and they want to help people understand what it really what it really was all about. Yeah, so, yeah. That's why I wanted to help you get the message out. So, folks, um, to either get more information, to find out how to get your own copy, and like I said, I, I recommend any anybody that's curious in any way about this, you're you're just not going to find something that's going to let you tap into and hear more directly from people doing the work and get more perspectives on the real story about surrogacy than you're going to get in this book. It, there just isn't a better source out there. And I'm not just saying that because I think of so much in Soba and I helped her with this. It, it is, there just isn't anything else out there that does it. <laughs> so. And we are available at Amazon, Amazon.com. Yeah. It comes in the form of an ebook and a hardcover book, soft cover. Cover I know this for a fact. <laughs> so, um, so look it up on Amazon. Well, actually, the information is all on my site. Just go to um, readyforloveradio.com slash surrogate, and that's, you're going to find all the information along with a replay of the show. 
all of it's going to be right there. So, Tova, I'm so excited. glad you were with me this evening. And listeners, I will see you next time on Ready for Love Radio.